is anyone else having a sense of deja vu? <laughs> I feel like we've been here, done that. The good news is there's a different title up, so I'm going to talk about um, something different. Uh, so uh, thank you again uh, for being here. And in this talk, I sort of have three goals. Um, the first goal I have is I, I want to kind of push your understanding of bullying and victimization and think about bullying as, an, as a, a shared trauma experience that's shared by all. And I'm going to show you some data that supports that approach. And then my second goal is, having hopefully convinced you of that, is to get you to think about what does that mean for practice? Practice in your classroom and practice in your schools and, and try and give you some very specific kinds of, of tips. I'm going to start my talk um, with probably something that doesn't surprise any of you, uh, which is relationships matter. Uh, there's a meta-analysis study, and what a meta-analysis does is it puts together all the research ever done on social relationships, um, and it says, you know, what, what, when we put them all together, what does it show? So when they put them all together, they had over 300,000 participants that had been studied on average for seven and a half years. And what they found was that having adequate social relationships was related to reducing your mortality by about 50%. The effect size of that is bigger than risk factors associated with, with obesity or smoking. So in other words, having relationships is a protective factor against many negative physical and including mortality. And so we need to think about that because I think about all the attention that we give to that, to, to those other issues which are important, risk factors for cancer, risk, um, we need to think about like uh, relationships in that same bucket. So I'm just gonna walk you through and sort of convince you why relationships matter to start with. So this is our health behavior survey of children and youth. And what this graph shows you is grade six to 10. And we asked youth, how, what percentage of you have a high quality relationship with your parents? And we asked that we didn't say it that way. We said, you know, do you, can you go to your parents when you have a problem? Do you trust your parents? Do you feel like um, your parents know you? Do you feel like you matter to your parents? And this graph says in grade six, about 43% of boys and about 40% of girls said, I feel that I have a high quality of relationship with my parents. And what you can see is that drops off by grade 10. By grade 10, it's about um, well, 19 and 18%, so about one in five. So in other words, as kids age, fewer and fewer kids are reporting having in a high quality relationship. And why does that matter? Well, this is an example about why it matters. So if you can see boys, and if, you, if you're in the blue, those are kids who reported having um, poor quality relationships. And, and the yellow is kids who reported having high quality relationship. So you're much less likely to have, report having emotional problems if you're in high quality relationships. Having a high quality relationship protects you. It, having a high quality relationship with your parent protects you from having emotional problems. And it's true, and that gradient is even stronger for girls than for boys. This is a really bad graph, my brother tells me, who's in social marketing. So I'm just gonna tell you the quick story <laughs> of my bad academic graph. What this graph basically shows you is that the more often you have dinner with your family, the more likely it is to buffer um, the effects that are associated with cyberbullying. And so, uh, if you, so, so the dark bars are that you experience cyberbullying often. If you often experience cyberbullying, then you're, you're more likely to have problems. But the more often you have dinner, it reduces the extent of those problems. And why? Think about what happens. What's the relationship mechanism that happens at dinner? You spend time with one another. You're sharing the intimacy of, of your day. You're sharing the stresses of your day. The adults at the table are role modeling on a good day, if it's my good day you know, how to regulate your emotion, how to regulate stress. You're connecting with one another, you're engaged. Interestingly, in Canada, we did some research and the average family dinner, this shocked me, is 17 minutes. So in other words, if you have dinner 17, for 17 minutes, three or more times a week, you can buffer the effects of cyberbullying for your kids. That's huge. And that doesn't take much. And I don't think it's about dinner or sitting around a table. I think it's about time spent, quality time spent and focused on one another um, to do it. So you can do some really small things that increases the likelihood that relationships matter. 
We also have teachers in the audience, so I wanted to show our data from our national study about the percentage of students that report having a high relationship, high quality relationship with teachers. So it's about 44% of kids in grade six boys and 52% of girls. And you can see it goes down to 17 and 18% by grade 10, one in five again. So relationships also matter for teachers. And here's one I wanted to pick an outcome that was related to well-being. So those kids in the yellow bars have high are reporting high quality relationships with their teacher. Those kids who have high quality relationships with their teacher are more likely to report well-being. What did the relationship questions look like? A lot like the ones for parents. I can trust my teacher. I can go to my teacher if I have a problem. My teacher knows me. I feel like I matter in the classroom. So in other words, the quality of relationships are protective. High quality relationships protect against negative outcomes. Low quality, and, and they also promote positive relationship, positive outcomes. Why did I say this? Because this is the end of my story, and this is the solution to how we deal with trauma. But here's the quick story that I want to tell you in Canada. We looked at 24 different health outcomes, and we looked at it in the 2002, 6, 10, 14 data set. And what we found was the same findings all across the board, that each type of relationship mattered uniquely. So parent relationships mattered for 23 out of 24 of those health outcomes. And they included things like being aggressive, healthy lifestyle, emotional health, risky behavior, academic achievement. Teacher relationships uniquely mattered for eight out of 24 one outcomes. They were related to um, academics, bullying, victimization, aggression, and healthy lifestyle kinds of outcomes. School relationships, that meant having somebody in the school that cared about me. So it wasn't just one teacher, it was an adult in the school. They mattered for 13 out of 24 outcomes. So all adults in the school have a role to play. Peer relationships mattered for 14, and neighborhood mattered for 12. This, this, we found these relationships at all of those data points. And in fact, the relationship to outcomes from the type of relationships got stronger over time. But you know what was concerning? Fewer and fewer kids were reporting having high quality relationships. So in Canada, we have a long way to go in terms of improving our relationships. And it's just, this is the solution to trauma. So let's get to why I want you to think about bullying as a trauma event. I've already talked this morning about bullying as a trauma experience. And I think it, that it's a trauma that's shared by all. So bullying is a destructive relationship where one individual has power over another and uses that to harm or hurt another, and it has a negative impact. And there's a high likelihood that I fear that it's going to happen again. And it often does happen again. And so what we find in our research is that in bullying, we can, we've started to look at the trauma. It's a shared common trauma experience that's, sh that's shared by all. And I'm going to make that case to you. Um, and part of it is that it's shared through the sense of being ostracized and rejected. Um, and it's also shared because kids who have, uh, there's a high relationship between kids who have experienced other types of trauma are also at risk for experiencing bullying. There's continuity in that developmental trajectory, and that's true for the perpetrators, and that's true for the youth who are being victimized um, as well. So what does this shared trauma look like? Well, when I think of the bullying episode, what happens when you experience trauma? The first thing that happens, or not the first thing, one of the things that happens is you experience fear. You be, you're afraid. You, and what happens when you're afraid? You become physiologically aroused. Your heart increases. It's mine's a little bit increased right now. I'd like to think of it as healthy arousal right now. Um, but your heart increases. You, you take shallower breaths. You become, um, and then you start to have what we call, you know, maladaptive thinking or cognitions. You start to think, worry that bad things are going to happen. You start to worry that you're feeling rejected. You start to worry um, that you're not safe. Um, and those things all happen. And what I'm going to argue today is our research shows that those experiences happen to the child who's bullied, the child who's, been, who's doing the bullying, and it ha there's some trauma to those who witness it as well. So in order to understand how that trauma works, we have to go back into your great, your genetics class maybe. Um, I promise not to get too technical, but there's a few things that I want you to understand about trauma and stress and brain development. Because ultimately trauma is in being in a heightened state of arousal and a heightened state of stress. 
And so that we know that if you're in a heightened, if a child has positive experiences, that the brain adapts. And so that makes those children um, more likely, more prepared for learning. They have better memories. They have improved um, emotional regulation. But if a child has stressful experiences, like has adversity in the home or has adversity in their peer relationships, the brain over time starts to adapt negatively with them either being overregulated, so they experience a constant stress, they're constantly vamped up in that fear, physiological and maladapted cognitions, or they're sort of spaced out, but they're, it's, but, so they're experiencing too little or too much. They've numbed themselves out. So one of the things that we know is that the brain um, it responds, that the brain interacts with their environment. In, in, in environments that have high relationship adversity, over time that leaves a mark on the brain and how we function and it leaves the chemical signatures on our genes. So let me give you an example. Here's the research um, on it, for example. Michael Meany was this researcher in Canada and what he did is he, um, he had aggressive rats and he, he put these aggressive rats in with nurturing mums. And what happened over time is those aggressive rats stopped being aggressive um, because they, and what, when he looked at the genetic thing, what had happened is it didn't change the genes. You can't change what's in your genes, but it can turn off. It left a chemical signature. So it was this epigenetic process where the, the, the rats that had been bred for being genetically aggressive, that gene got turned off, so to speak, and they weren't in a nurturing, caring environment. For those genes, for those rats that were highly aggressive, he put them with highly aggressive mums and they became more aggressive over time. So that left a chemical signature. So in a sense, we also know that we can, those models have been extended to children and youth. That if we, we actually put children who are, have adverse relationship experiences into nurturing environments, we can affect their epigenetics. We can affect the kinds of things. So children who have experienced lots of trauma in nurturing environments it, it, it can change the way that the genes express themselves. So let's take this back to bullying and victimization. So I just want to be clear, people ask me all the time, we have really strong ethics approval in Canada, so when I tell you about our experiments, I want you to know that they passed ethics boards and the kids are all debriefed and they're all fine. That should get your attention now. Um, and what we do in our research um, is we have kids play a game called Cyberball. And in Cyberball, what happens is we, we have fake players who are really attractive and the same age as the child. And then we take, so when the child comes into the lab, we take their picture, we put it up in the Cyberball, and we say, you're playing this game with these other kids. And for the first 10 to 15 throws, these kids equally throw the ball around. And then on the 15th throw or so, they, stop, they exclude that child. They stop throwing it to the participant. And what we're doing is it's an ethical way that we can look at what happens in the moment when someone gets socially excluded, which is a form of bullying, and it happens repeatedly because they never get back in the game, and they just happen to be lying in an MRI machine, so we can take a scan of their brains, and we happen to hook them up to a heart monitor, so we're taking their heart rate, and we're also measuring their sweat. We're also, they're hooked up to that. I know, you're all thinking, I'd really love for my children to participate in this research. Um, but it allows us to see what's actually happening in the moment when kids are experiencing. And what we've done is we've brought in a group of kids who have a history of being bullied or victimized. We've brought in a group of kids who have a history of bullying others. We brought a group of kids in who have a history of defending, so standing up for other kids. And then we brought in control kids. And this is what we see. In the, the kids who have the history of being bullied, what you see is as they're playing the game, that as soon as they get excluded, you can see their heart increase, rates increase, and they start to increase in their sweat. So they have that first part of trauma, that increased physiological arousal. And then because they're not doing enough, after a certain point, we ask them questions about the emotions that they're experiencing. And what these kids is, re report is they're exp experiencing a high emotional dysregulation. They're feeling angry, they're feeling hostile, they're feeling left out. Um, and so you see that kind of the thoughts that are associated with trauma and you see the physiological arousal that's associated with trauma. Interestingly, what happens to the kids who come in and have a history of 
being victimized is their heart rate increases almost immediately in the first time that they get excluded and it just starts escalating up and they start sweating. Um, so they're getting physiological aroused. So both groups of kids are getting physiological aroused and then both groups of kids are getting emotionally dysregulated. Those kids who are, they're reporting high levels of aggression, but they're also reporting high levels of hostility and they're also reporting high levels of, of perceived um, 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 anxiety. So they're showing different ways of that emotional dysregulation, but they're also becoming dysregulated. So both kids in the interaction are experiencing it, trauma uh, that's in the same way. They also are reporting sort of feeling rejected. So the kids who bully are reporting that, they're, that they feel like no one cares about them, they feel like they're being rejected, they feel, and, and the kids who are victimized are reporting exactly the same thing, but they're also reporting high levels of shame, that they want to hide, they feel like it's them, they feel like it's their fault. And what happens, though, is those rejections increase the dysregulation for the kids who have the history of bullying, but the rejection shuts down the kids who are victimized. They have that fear response. They shut down, but for the kids who are doing the bullying, they get vamped up. They become more dysregulated, but the kids who are, have a history of being victimized, that shuts them down. They become sort of in the flight one. So we also look at what's going on in the brain. And there's a couple of things that you need to know. There is no test at the end, um, I promise. Um, but the area of the brain that's associated with pain. So if you physically hurt yourself, there's an area in the brain called the anterior cingular cortex. That brain, when, a, in, when you do an MRI, you're looking at the blood flow. How does the blood go to that? So when you have physical pain, the blood goes to the anterior cingular cortex. When kids experience this rejection, do you know what happens? The blood goes to the anterior cingular cortex, all of our groups. So in other words, kids are experiencing that rejection in the game, that social exclusion. That they experience that the same way they experience physical, physical pain at a brain level. If you have a history of being victimized, that area lights up first. And what you can do in very complicated analysis that I actually pay someone else to do, you can follow the blood flow in the brain. And what happens is the kids who have a history of being victimized, the, the area associated with the pain lights up, then it goes to the area associated with fear and arousal. So they feel the fear and they get aroused, which we saw also in the physiological arousal. And then the next area of the brain that gets lit up is the area that's associated with emotional memory. So you know what we think is happening? We think they're getting triggered. We think they're remembering other times in their brain that they've been victimized. And then what happens is they get emotional. And that's that fight, fear or flight response that they responded to. And so you can actually by looking at the blood flow and where the blood flows in the brain, we can understand what's happening in that moment of trauma. These kids are experiencing trauma. They're reliving other times that they've experienced victimization. They're getting dysregulated. They're, um, and they're, very, they're, um, they're, they're experiencing high levels of fear. The other interesting thing, and we've done this in another study, where we've looked at, we, you, what you can do is we, can, we show kids um, pictures of kids being of kids bullying other kids, and what you when we put them on an eye tracker, so we can actually see where their eyes are looking at in the picture. And that's this last piece: is that where do they look? The kids who are victimized, the first place they look, who have a history of being victimized, when they're in the eye tracker, they look at the person who's doing the bullying's face. Then they dart out and look at the peer group's faces, and then they come back to the person who's um, victimizing, who's doing the bullying to them. So that's what they do. The other piece that you need to know is the more, the more frequently I've been victimized, the faster the blood circulates in that, through that process. And so the more rapid your response is. So kids who have a chronic a history, of chronic history of being victimized, experience that brain activity much faster. In fact, what you actually see in another, uh, not my research, but somebody else's research where they measure evoked potentials in the brain, if you show kids who have been, uh, kids a picture of bullying, uh, just a picture of bullying, the brain reacts within 500 milliseconds. That's faster than I can say a word. That's, fast, that's at a pre-conscious level. So that's how fast 
kids' brains are reacting to bullying and the trauma associated with bullying. So it's not surprising that in Canada we find there's a huge association between peer victimization and, and post-traumatic stress syndrome, that these kids report high levels of that. So we have about 30% of boys and about um, 42% 40, of, of girls that report that because what happens at the brain describes that trauma. So that increases the trauma, the, the likelihood that they're going to have post-traumatic stress syndrome. In other work, we've looked at, can we predict who these kids are that are most likely going to experience trauma? And again, this is a study of over 10,000 kids. And we found that for kids, it was two key factors that predicted that. The duration for how long the victimization has been going on and the number of places were related to their externalizing problems. So in other words, if it had been going on for more than two months, and if they had experienced bullying in more than two places, like in the halls, in the classrooms, out in the schoolyard, on the way to and from school, in more than three places, excuse me, more than three places, then they were much more likely to have this trauma response, like much more likely to have mental health problems, and they were the kids that were going faster through the brain um, response. Other researchers have also found that kids and people in general can relive and re-experience social pain, so that social pain like being excluded, much more easily than physical pain, and that their brain response is more intense to these emotional experiences than to the physical experiences. So that's why we've come to think about being bullied and victimization as a traumatic experience. I can't tell you what happens to the kids who bullies brains because we're still analyzing it. So I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have that part of the story on the brain front, but we certainly see um, from their physiological arousal and their cognitions that it looks like they're also experiencing trauma. There's also some evidence to show that kids who witness bullying experience some sort of trauma. So witnessing bullying is associated with somatic complaints. So that's that having headaches or stomach aches without a, a physical cause. They're more likely to experience elevated symptoms, not, not clinical levels, but elevated symptoms of depression and anxiety. And they're more likely to use substance abuse, probably to numb the pain that's associated with it. So even those, what's different is that that's short-lived. That association is not like, as the less you witness it, the less likely that association exists. So the more you witness it, the stronger association that is. So I'm gonna step back and also argue that the kids who defend experience a bit of trauma, but in a different way. And, but it requires you to understand bullying in a group context. Cause I'm saying, I'm saying that the bullying is a shared trauma. And what you need to understand in, uh, is that bullying in, in my research days, um, in my early research days with Dr. Pepler, we put remote microphones on children and we filmed them in the schoolyard. And we had the privilege of sort of peeking into children's world and seeing what it was like. And what we found, and this was my dissertation work, was that bullying happened about once every seven and a half minutes on the playground, and that peers were present in about 85% of the episodes. So in other words, it was a frequent experience. So if I have trauma from bullying, then I'm ex exposed to it frequently and regularly on it. The other thing that we found is that kids, and it depended on our study, but um, like one in four in our best, in our highest level, defend it. So in other words, the kids that defended, it happened about 25% of the episodes, which was actually interestingly higher than um, 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 our teachers in that. Um, so what we found is bystanders, whether you witness it or not, you can play different roles. You can escalate the victimization. And we actually saw that kids who are standing around um, they were much more likely to make eye contact with the person who was doing the bullying. They were much more likely to talk to the person who was doing the bullying, and they very rarely talked to the person who was being victimized. Um, the other thing that we coded in there was sort of the emotional regulation of it. So what we found is that the kids that were standing around amplified or mimicked the person who was doing the bullying's emotions, not the person who was being victimized emotions. There was a small person, that group of kids that defended that I talked about, um, and you were more likely to defend if it was your friend being victimized. So lots of work has been done 
to look at peers becoming upstanders and peers being involved. And in fact, Dorothy Espelage did a meta-analysis and she found that the programs that focused on bystander intervention actually were effective and that was a good thing to focus on. But what I'm gonna argue is not all kids should be defending because some kids experience trauma when they defend. Here's, an ex here's the proportion of youth who intervene in Canada when we ask them. And I put this up because it's striking about how fast it falls off. So many more kids intervene when you're in grades four to six, and then it completely falls off. We have to do a lot more in high schools to support kids, um, to intervene and to change the peer norms around intervening and supporting youth who are being victimized because they tend not to get involved because of the potential cost. You're more likely to intervene if it's someone you know, like if it's someone, a family member, a close friend, a dating partner, or a schoolmate. But if it's someone you don't know, then about 37% of kids are going to intervene. So that talks about the importance and the power of creating connections to get kids to intervene and to intervene for others. Why they intervene. So this is related to the cognition. Um, the number one reason, because nobody deserves to be bullied. We talk about bullying from a human rights perspective. Um, it's not fair. I wanted to help. The person needed help. Um, you know, so those, the, the, stopping bullying is everyone's responsibility. So there seems to be work to be done. If we can encourage the moral and ethical integrity of kids, we can get them to intervene more often. However, not all kids should intervene. Some kids suffer when they intervene. So this slide shows basically that um, ki defenders, kids who defend are more likely to ex report having internalizing problems um, for, than, than kids who witness if you're a male, or they're more likely to have academic problems if you're a male and you defend. Versus if you're female and you defend compared to those who witness, you're more likely to experience relationship problems. So in other words, we have to support kids because they are at risk. Like, so one of the things we know, kids with high status are less likely to experience negative kinds of things. Um, and so we have to think about who we're training to intervene so that they don't have the trauma and they don't have these negative repercussions on them. The other thing that we know is the more you intervene, what this graph shows is the more you defend, the more likely you are to have health, mental health issues. So you're more likely to have psychosomatic problems or you're more likely to have relationship problems, particularly if you're a girl. So the more you defend, so there's some cost to defending and not all kids should defend even though we are telling them to. So we need to be really careful in our programs. And I'm also gonna now show you um, some data about what's happening in their brains. Um, but before I do, I just wanna say, where do bystanders observe bullying? And this relates to my trauma story. They reserve it everywhere. I put this graph on to say it happens everywhere, in the community, everywhere in the school, it's happening. So if trauma, imagine if I'm getting repeatedly exposed to things, and it's happening, like I said, it's happening every seven and a half minutes on the playground, but if I'm getting repeatedly exposed to things, then I'm get reliving my trauma repeatedly over time. And so, when I think about that, just think about kids who are victimized and they come in and from the playground and then we sit them down and we give them a math test. They're not going to be able to do well in the math test because they've experienced a trauma. They've relived trauma. They've relived their memories of trauma. And so we need to actually calm them down, readjust them, and then, then we can focus on the learning. They are not going to be capable of learning or memory. Both are affected if you've experienced trauma, and especially if trauma is all around you and everywhere you go. So this is what happened in the brain scans of the kids who were defenders. What happened is the anterior cingular cortex, remember that area, lit up. So that's the area that's associated with physical pain. So they experience the same level of pain as our kids and at a brain level. It's reacting the same way. Their brains are reacting the same way as those kids who were defending, I mean, who were victimized. The next area that gets lit up, um, I put in the names because I got asked the names the other day. So I had this slide much simpler and then someone said, what are all the brain area names? So I put them up there so you can tell your friends. Um, the next area that lights up with kids who defend is empathy, the area in the brain that's associated with empathy. So these kids experience the pain, the area, these are kids who defend, and the, then the area that's associated with empathy lights up 
and then the area that's associated with motor activation lights up. And so these kids, at a brain level, it mirrors their actions. They see the bullying unfold, they experience the pain, that's the trauma a bit and that they experience, they experience deep empathy, and then they activate themselves to do something about it. So at a brain level, we're repeating their measures. So what does all of this mean? And let me put it together. So what I've argued and what I've tried to show you is at a brain level, at a symptom level, at a cognition level, at a physiological level, kids who are victimized experience bullying incidences as they experience trauma. We see it, that they have, a, it's, it's, it's the same experience as experiencing trauma. Kids who, are, kids who bully also experience trauma. They're, they experience the fear, they experience the arousal, they experience the emotional um, dysregulation. They also experience as trauma. For some kids who witness it, they're at risk and they experience it as trauma, only it's short-lived. For kids who defend, some kids shouldn't defend because they experience it as trauma. But the kids who um, defend, and the more you defend, the more likely you are to experience it as trauma. So we have to, what does that mean? It means that our interventions need to address the trauma that's experienced by all of these kids. Our interventions need to be trauma-informed. And that's why the research shows these kinds of things don't work. I normally don't tell people what not to do, but because this is a trauma, I want you to get it. So zero tolerance and punitive practices are not going to work for kids who have ex are experiencing trauma. They're not, you know, I always go back to bullying is a relationship problem that requires relationship solutions. We need to give children and youth the relationship solutions that are going to enable them going forward. Punishing them is not going to give them the solutions that they need to go forward. Lots of parents want to protect their kids and say, you know, you don't keep exposing yourself to social media. That's not, that's not going to help. We actually find when you take social media away from kids who have been victimized, it further isolates them. It makes them more isolated because, as we're going to talk about in our fishbowl, social media is the way for these kids to connect. And it's safe, and they can control it on their own way. There's an element of control in their social media connections. They choose when, where, and how. Addressing bullying with celebrity, not expertise. Bringing in a guest speaker that's famous for one day is not going to solve trauma. It's going to heighten awareness. It's going to increase awareness and make people think about the issue. But you're talking about youth and children who've experienced trauma. And that, if, if that was the way of the world, we would, it would be much easier for us. One-time interventions are not going to fix trauma. It's a long time in building up. It's a long relationship. In, in developing and it's a long pro and it's going to require intense solutions. The other thing is working with just individuals isn't going to solve trauma because trauma is, expo is, is experienced by all, it's experienced by the child who's bullying, the child who's doing, being victimized, the peer group. We need to address all of those people. And lastly, ignoring adults' role modeling is not going to help address the trauma because we could be inadvertently like adults need to be aware of their, their behaviors because we need to address, we don't want to put kids in environments where adults are yelling at them and that's part of their history of trauma. So what does this mean for your practice and what can you do and what are some things to think about? The first thing is we need to recognize the signs of trauma. We need to be aware um, about what some of those signs might be. So for youth and children, what we find is that they might have real concerns about their safety. Kids who have experienced trauma are overly concerned about their safety from an outsider view because we don't know their history. So we need to identify and mark any child who's concerned about their safety or does, is reticent to go out, is reticent to be in places without adult supervision. We need to be thinking about that a sign of trauma is kids who feel overwhelmed by feelings of fear or sadness, that they have experienced, the, uh, they live in a world where they, that is unpredictable and unreliable, and so they have extreme fear of what's going to happen, or their sadness. We know that excessive arousal, exposure to excessive stress, or a heightened stress response, like what happens to those kids who have been victimized and bullied, interferes at, with their ability to learn 
or their ability to concentrate. If I'm focused on how I'm going to be safe, where I can go to be safe, or if I'm constantly worrying about what's going to happen to me next or who's going to get to me next, then I'm not going to learn and I'm not going to be able to focus and concentrate on things. Another sign of trauma is that you're avoiding people or places or things that I don't make the bus to go home, that I don't, um, I'm reticent to go out. I go hide in the corners of the library. I hide in the washroom. Um, kids who experience trauma are also self-conscious. They, they think that everybody's looking at them. They think that everybody's watching them. Um, and they also experience high levels of shame and guilt. So they might be hiding themselves. They might be excessively apologizing for things. These kids live in a world where they're constantly blamed and made to feel guilty for things or feel guilty or because of their experiences. The other thing is that we have to be trauma responsive. And sometimes kids who have experienced trauma are, are challenging to deal with. They may be acting out in class because they can't concentrate. They may be, be and, and, and adults sometimes have the experience that they're just trying to press my buttons. These kids are just trying to push my buttons. These are the children and the youth who are most vulnerable in your classrooms that require us to be the most affirming and the most accommodating. These are the children and the youth that we have to count 10 for. We have to model and regulate for them. Um, we have to coach them. We have to scaffold them in those emotional regulation skills. These are kids that often will constantly talk about how they're worried about things or what they're worried about what will happen because they live in unpredictable environments. And school, if they're experiencing regular and frequent bullying, is in a completely unsafe, unpredictable environment. So what do we do to help kids who have that experience? We work to provide structure and predictability. Routines matter to kids. And it's not just young kids, it's all kids and especially kids who have experienced trauma. We need to have predictability, structure. There's really nice research that shows that if you have consistency and high structure and high warmth in classrooms, it's just like parenting. You have lower rates of bullying and victimization, and you have lower rates of kids reporting internalizing and externalizing problems. So high, so in, as a classroom practice, you want to have lots of structure in a warm and caring environment. Sometimes these kids can perseverate or focus a lot on how they feel. Um, or you might not perceive that there has been bullying, or you may not have seen it happen, or you may not be able to um, justify it. It doesn't matter, because what those kids are experiencing, it's not just one event. It's an accumulation of events. Kids who have experienced trauma are not responding to the thing that may be just happening in front of them in that moment, in that interaction. They're responding to their life history of abuse their life history of repeated victimization over time. So sometimes our experience is, wow, they've really reacted here. And that's also a, a warning sign for you, or it's, it's a red flag for you as an educator that if they, if they are having that response, these are kids who are likely repeating, experiencing repeated trauma. And the most important thing we can do is we don't have to... We don't have to, like, sometimes I get asked a lot by educators about, well, I don't know if it really happened or not. Like, how do I know if the bullying really happened? It doesn't matter. I can validate that. Wow, that sounds like that was really hard for you. I'm validating their perceptions of the experience. I'm validating their emotions of the experience. It sounds like it, that really frightened you and you feel really scared. What can we do to make you feel safe in this moment? building safety plans, having discussions about how kids can feel safe, how they can feel comfortable, how they can feel supported. It's okay to talk to them directly about those kinds of things. We don't have to engage in who did what to whom if you can't sort that out or it's just too messy or too complicated, but we can always validate that person's emotions and experience of that event and talk about how we can work together to make them feel safer and make them um, feel better. It's really important for these kids, because they have so much shame and the guilt and, and the low self-esteem, that we create opportunities for them to set and achieve goals. That it, again, it's about being predictable. They need to feel that they have been successful at something. One of the concepts that I talk a lot about um, 
that Deborah Pepler introduced was this notion of social architecture. How can I celebrate and arrange the peer group to, to celebrate the success of this individual child who might have experienced trauma? If they're really good at chess or if they're really good at running, then how can I pair them up with someone who's highly socially competent in the classroom that peers can start to see them differently and can start to also celebrate that success? There's a, we did a little research study based on a teacher practice and we found it highly valuable. So this teacher, she's from New York City, this teacher uh, had this, she was a math teacher, and every Friday she asked the kids who they wanted to sit beside the next week. And she had said, you may not get to sit beside them. And, and um, what she, she was really doing is she was identifying who are the kids who don't get asked to sit beside? Who are the kids who never get nominated to sit beside? And she would take those kids and sit, beside, and sit them beside the kid who got the most nominations every week. And then she'd put some other kids together. So she really viewed it as a math problem. So we took that and we tried that in classrooms and we didn't do it in other classrooms. And what did we find? We found there were lower rates of victimization. Kids were more likely to report that they felt like they belonged and they were more likely to report that they were connected to others in the classroom if we engaged in social architecture by that simple practice. We connected to them to their peers and we gave them opportunities to be celebrated and to be acknowledged and connected. There is a direct relationship between trauma and learning. Kids who experience high levels of trauma are less likely to be effective learners in the classroom. We know that. It affects their brain development. It affects the way that they can process information. Um, and particularly in memory. So one of the things that we have to do is focus on safety and the task at hand. So in Canada, one of the things that we're moving towards in, 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 from this approach is when, in, when younger kids in our elementary schools come in from recess, knowing that bullying happens once every seven and a half minutes, we actually spend the first five to 10 minutes engaging in settling in. And that settling in, and we also do it in high school, less time, um, I admit. Um, and it's just about helping kids with the transition. So it might be a relaxation moment. It might be a tape moment. Some teachers play songs and music. But what it is, it's engaging kids. If you can imagine, try and imagine what it's like to have, be a child who's been victimized and to have to walk down that high school hallway and feel that fear and live in that anticipatory fear and be increased in your arousal and have all of these cognitions and worries about what's gonna happen next and then go in to your, your geography class and have to focus. So what we're saying is let's take five minutes and bring everybody's level down. Let's calm everybody down. Let's do that through, and some teachers do it in different ways, but it's really called the five minute they call it the five minute shuffle in some of our schools and some big, and it's really about some people do very simple yoga and you hold different things. Some people do mindfulness, some people do relaxation, some people do music, um, but it's a way to help kids settle in. Um, one of the things that's challenging for kids who've experienced trauma, whether they bully or whether they've been victimized, um, is that it's challenging for them to regulate themselves, that they have trouble. So what can we do? We can break down the tasks into very small pieces because they'll be able to remember that small piece and they'll be able to take that small piece on. They cannot have a long instruction and then go forward. So we have to be conscious and aware of how we ask kids to do things. It's also we have to be conscious and aware about how we intervene and support kids when they become dysregulated. We want to break that task down. We want to give them lots of opportunities to practice, practice, practice. We want to give them opportunities to practice with coaching and feedback. We want to give them opportunity to practice in the moment with coaching and feedback. Um, and we want to focus on those positive things that they're doing. Um, we also need to recognize that they're going to need more breaks than other kids because kids who have experienced trauma have memory issues. The other thing that um, we really focus on is it's, it's, it's okay to ask kids what they want and what they need. Um, and we can create and orchestrate and 
um, create, engage in, so, in social architecture and environmental architecture to create nurturing classrooms by setting them up to meet the, the students' needs and their classrooms. So, you know, we have places in classrooms, and sometimes it's outside of classrooms, where kids can go if they need a break. That is, it's, it's okay for them to leave the classroom to go there. We have code words for kids to do that so that they can do it in a confidential, safe manner. But it's creating the classroom in a way that recognizes where they're at, and it's also in creating a classroom that has warm and authentic kinds of relationships that's about compassions. So when I think about bullying, and I think about a trauma-informed approach, lots of our programs are not designed to, to think about it from a trauma perspective. And when you look at the efficacy of those programs, they reduce bullying when they're fully implemented in the way that, that the program says that they're supposed to be implemented by about 30%. Well, I want you to stop and think about that for a minute. If you took a, if you had a headache and your, your aspirin only worked one every three times, you wouldn't be very happy about that. You wouldn't likely take that medicine again. So our programs are simply not enough. And most of them, they're not enough because the bullying prevention programs are designed not to support those kids or not that, that are experiencing the highest levels of trauma. Those kids are always going to need more support. And those, you know, and so we have to identify who those children and youth are in our classrooms, and we have to provide more support. And the other thing that I think about a lot is often when we um, introduce and have a bullying prevention program in our classroom, we're doing that, you know, less than 45 minutes a week. Well, those youth are in our classroom for an, another 24 hours a week. And so it's, it's about what we do beyond the program and how we support children and youth beyond that program. It's about the relationships that we create. It's about the moment-to-moment -moment ones where we engage. And that's why I really focused on the practices that you can engage to create the warm and compassionate relationships and the role modeling that you need um, to, to make those kids who are experiencing it. So in the research on what is a nurturing classroom. Well, we think about a classroom as the set of relationships. Lots of people talk about class climate, and we talk about climate, the school climate or the classroom climate being about the, 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 the sum of the relationships and the quality of the relationships in the classroom. And so when we think about what is a nurturing class environment, it's one where the teacher is attuned to the individual needs of the students, where the teacher um, reinforces the, the pro-social behaviors. You focus on the behaviors that you want to see more of and you reinforce of them. Think about that story I told about aggressive kids. Um, you think about kids who've experienced trauma need boundaries and need limits and need monitoring so that you want to monitor and limit the opportunities that kids have for negative behavior and you want to create opportunities for positive behavior. You want to engage in behaviors that minimize the stress in classrooms, and so that will reduce the stressful events like bullying. Um, and you really want to create that relationship. I'm going back to thinking about you want to create the nurturing relationship. You want to coach students um, to have the relationship skills, and you want to create that relationship um, that's going to enable them to move forward. So in our work in Canada, we've really moved to an approach where we view that the teachers are the leaders in the classroom. They're trauma-informed leaders in the classroom that, are, that can be trained to shape classroom behaviors that will support kids, the most at-risk kids, um, right through to the, the kids that, that, will be, that, that don't need that intense support. And how do they do it? They do it by modeling the relationship styles that they expect by rewarding the positive behavior, by reinforcing the positive behavior, by being that social architect in that classroom, by being aware of when kids who, uh, by putting, so there's lots of research to show when we put aggressive kids together, do you know what happens? They become more aggressive over time. They call that the iatrogenic effects. So what we need to do is we need to immerse that child who's aggressive with children who are socially competent so they have the opportunity to learn the skills that they need to learn from those that can do them. And we actually know that uh, the research has shown it doesn't hurt the socially competent kids to immerse them with the, the aggressive kids because they're socially competent. But it does really support the aggressive kids. We need to really focus on scaffolding and coaching really important skills in self-regulation and social skills. Um, 
we need to identify the most vulnerable and engage in some of those practices that I talked about. And we need to think about promoting children and youth. I always remember, and it was interesting for me to sit this morning um, and listening to our Welcome to Country. Um, I went to a, a training once, and we, the, it was um, with a, Aboriginal training in universities and university classrooms and how to create respectful classrooms. And the, the woman, um, the Aboriginal woman who was leading the training said, please go around um, and introduce yourselves. And we all went around and I'm like, hi, I'm Wendy Craig, I'm head of department of psychology and I'm Jean Cote and I'm so-and-so, you know, in, in um, health studies and I'm Will Pickett and I do epidemi I'm in epidemiology. And then she said, nobody, we went around the room, everybody did the same thing. And then she said, I don't know any of you. None of you introduced yourselves. You all gave me your job title and your name. And that's not introducing yourselves. If we're going to work together on this very important issue, we have to start by taking risks and learning and knowing everybody. And then we have to go around again and reintroduce ourselves. And so the point of that is that's what we need to do in our classrooms so that we can highlight and celebrate the individual skills that children have you know, so, you know, when we went around the second time, I talked about, you know, that I'm, you know, my name's Wendy and I'm a mom and this is what I do. And I gave them information about who I was and what, what uh, some personal information about me. So I have a couple of messages for you that I want you to take away um, today. The first message that I have for you is bullying is a shared trauma. And that trauma is experienced by the youth who bullies, the youth who's victimized, and the youth who are witnessing it. The effects of that trauma are more severe and more significant the more often that you witness it. That trauma can be seen in their physiological response, in the response in their brain, and in the way that they think about the situation. It's shared trauma. We need to think about creating trauma-informed classrooms that enable us to recognize trauma and respond to trauma and meet the needs of all the kids in our class. And we do that by creating relationships and creating nurturing environments in our schools, in our families that support the optimal development of youth. And when I travel, I like to bring my set, I'm a mom, so this is my daughter. And we know that kids don't grow up in a bubble and but they grow up in nurturing and so they they are out in the world and they experience different challenges and different barriers they're exposed to things like bullying and victimization and we can't keep them in a bubble but what we can do is create the environment and the relationships that prevent them from having the the outcomes associated with trauma and promote their well-being thank you I said I was going to leave some time for questions, but as a good academic, I haven't left that much time. But I, I'm happy to take uh, any burning questions, and I'm happy to stay afterwards if I haven't got around to everybody. Yeah, we have. A, do we have a mic? Did we say? Oh, okay. This is where you get to pretend you're on Oprah. And oh, that's this is. I'll try and pick questions that are close together and clustered so that this is not hard. Thank you so much. Very interesting. Um, I listened particularly to your statement that teachers should reward um, the behaviours they want to see. And it strikes me that a lot of the time when we do public rewarding, we also can inadvertently do public shaming. Particularly if, you know, there's the kids who, inverted commas, push buttons, and often they're excluded from the reward range, sometimes publicly in the classroom as a method of group management. I'd just like your reflection on appropriate rewarding. That's a great question. So I think about rewarding as creating social norms. And I think every child does something that can be rewarded. Um, and, and we just have to focus on what those things are. And sometimes they're unique. You know, Wendy, you did a great job in being creative today. Or, you know, what, uh, 
Joe, Joey, I really appreciate how well you've sat through the class. Maybe there's someone that can do, have done that. Or, you know, like I think every day, every child can do something that can be acknowledged and rewarded and celebrated. And that's, you know, I didn't talk about it, but another thing that we talk a lot about educators is, is with their own self-awareness. Um, and we have a little, um, uh, it's a little task that our, re our, our, our teachers do, and it's, it's that they have to notice, they have to, at the beginning of the day, they wrote, write down what they want to focus on, and some of them focus on rewarding. And at the end of the day, they have to do a reflection paragraph on what they rewarded and how they want to change. So what they did, what they did well, and what they want to do differently. And I think it's, it's increasing our awareness about how, and having that, um, that will really bring about the, the, the change that we want and create the norms in the classrooms that we want. So it's not just all about good behavior, it's also about creating the relationships and making everybody be recognized for things that they do. Wendy, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, just picking up on your point there about creating norms in the classroom and the networks and building up relationships, all of that makes great sense to me. My own experience of bullying, and I'm sure everybody's had experiences, is that bullies look for a perceived weakness in their victims. I'm wondering where you feel that the concept of building up resilience in individuals fits in with all of this, because it would seem to me that individual resilience, being able to stop the bullying at a very early stage, is a very important part of this. Okay. Um I'm going to answer that in a way that we think about resilience differently in Canada. Uh, we're shifting our move away from an individual perspective because I think that leads to victim blaming attitudes. If, it, if I'm not resilient, then I'm going to get, you know, I, I'm being victimized because I'm not resilient. I don't think that's true. I think we create resilient, we, we create nurturing environments that, that enable resilience. So I think it's, it's not a thing that resides within the child, it's a thing that resides within the child and interacts with the environment. So that, it's, that we don't build resilience in children, we build resilient environments. We build environments that promote the social skills and, and the kinds of things that you need to be successful. And, that, and that's going back to the other comment, is about norming. Because I worry, I, I worry a lot about putting the onus on kids who are at the bottom of a power imbalance that they have to solve the problem. And at the, at the very base, bullying is about a power imbalance and we need to write that power imbalance. And in order to write that, we need adult support and adult help and they can do that through relationships and environment. I'm sticking on message. Okay, could we have one more? Okay. I just want to let you know that she gets to be the first person to go for lunch. You look very fit. She's probably going to outrun us all anyway. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Annette Swain. I'm just um, asking, uh, do you think that adult bullying victims uh, is less traumatic than children? And do you believe that all this um, improving uh, relationships between children and respectful behaviours will actually hopefully eventually roll into having respectful behaviours for adults in the workplace in the future? Absolutely, and there's, there's, a, there's definitely longitudinal research that shows that, that kids who bully, uh, that there's stability over that unless we intervene. And so if we change the culture and we change our expectations and norms about how children and youth interact with one another, then we can change um, that going forward. That would be my hope. But we also have to look at ourselves at a society level and what we reward um, at a society level, you know, someone might say there's some people who are incredibly successful in the United States right now, um, and that behavior is rewarded. Um, and so I think we also, it's not just about, it, it's, that's why the community response is, is necessary, right? It's about what parents do, it's about what the media does and how we portray things, it's about our interactions, like it's about schools, it's about clubs, it's all of those things and our socio-ecological perspective that we need to address if we're gonna change and develop the next generation that's kinder and more connected and has more healthy relationships. Yes, agreed, and let's hope we can make Australia great again and lower that suicide rate with all the bullying that goes on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much and enjoy lunch. I believe that's the next thing. <laughs>